Hello everyone, welcome back to Suited for Gaming. Now, if you're one of the two or three people who watch my game reviews, you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world happened here? What happened to the format, man? Well, I decided to change it after getting feedback from some of you guys, which basically confirmed my initial hesitations about the layout. Now, there was just too many things happening on screen. It confused some people and it took the focus away from the game, so I decided to make some changes that pay attention mostly on the games while still maintaining portions of the previous format that made the reviews unique. So I just want to say thank you very much for sending feedback my way. It's greatly appreciated and please continue to do so because if I have the technical know-how, then you better believe that I'm going to continue working on it. But enough about that, uh, without further ado, let's get back to the review, shall we? Because today, we'll be looking at Batman Arkham Knight on the PlayStation 4. It would have been on the PC, but I couldn't even get it to start running. So what can you do? We have lived through dark days, and no doubt there are more to come. But it is the good and great men who stand up for Gotham when others turn and run. In death, I will love you forever. Your father, Thomas. Now Arkham Knight comes to us from Rocksteady, the developers who brought the series in the limelight beginning with Arkham Asylum. A game that was linear but offered a very in-depth experience. They followed that up with Arkham City which embraces most of the fundamentals of the open world extravaganza that we're all familiar with. But they did it in a way that didn't compromise most of the elements that made Asylum great. Now we have Arkham Knight, a game whereby Arkham City is on lockdown, and I'm reading this verbatim straight from the box here as the united forces of Gotham's supervillains take control of the city. The Dark Knight unleashes the all-new transformable Batmobile in the explosive finale to the Arkham Trilogy. Now I don't usually pay too much attention to the case, but someone pointed this out to me. There's a story they're not telling you here, and it's called Arkham Origins. It's the third game in the series. See, Origins is a game that was developed by Warner Brothers Montreal, the only game in the series that did not have Rocksteady's name on it. Now, it was riddled with uh, problems that easily made it the worst in the series, but did that make it a bad game? No, not really. Despite its flaws, it was a good game. Not spectacular, not outstanding, not excellent, but a good game nonetheless. So no, the Arkham series is not a trilogy, and it's ironic that the publishers would try to ignore Origins' existence because of its flaws, especially considering what a mess Arkham Knight is compared to its predecessor. And I know, this is a controversial opinion, but an opinion all the same. And I'll explain where I'm coming from by looking at some of the good and the bad points about Arkham Knight, as usual, starting with gameplay and mechanics. Let's start off by addressing Arkham Knight's biggest pitch to the audience, its poster child, the Batmobile. From the previews and trailers, you could tell that the Batmobile was introduced with the best of intentions. A feature, if you will, to present a new dimension to the Arkham series that would make it stand out from the rest. It does manage to do that effectively because I'm sure a few years down the line when people talk about Arkham Knight, the first thing that will come to their minds is the Batmobile. But that begs the question, 
Will it be remembered as a positive thing? Well, yes and no. You see, the Batmobile definitely has its place in the series. There are some sections in the game that make sense for the Batmobile, especially puzzles where Batman needs to manipulate the environment at a scale that's too big, even for him. I especially like this moments because puzzles are now much grander than what we were used to in the previous three games. The problem, however, is that these moments are few and far between, yet with the Batmobile being the selling point of the game, its implementation is blown beyond any reasonable proportion. Take some of the Riddler's puzzles, for example. There's a puzzle that requires you to provide electrical current to a switch in order to solve it. The switch is located on a ledge that Batman could very easily grapple onto and use his remote electrical charge gun to power that switch. But no, you have to use the Batmobile and go through a series of nonsensical vehicular platforming events and use the Batmobile's winch to provide the current to the switch. If that doesn't convince you, then take the Riddler trophies as another example. There are some that require you to race to a specific destination on the map, under a specific allotted time frame. They're pretty challenging to accomplish until you realize that you don't really need the Batmobile to get you there. You can easily grapple your way to the destination in less time with little to no obstacles in your way. And as annoying as these moments are, they pale in comparison to the vehicular combat sections of the game. And I use the term sections lightly here because a vast majority of the game comprises of these moments and around 15 to 20 minutes into the game, you are introduced to the Batmobile, and from there you have to chase down and blow up a runaway vehicle. And from there you have to find your way into another section of Arkham, but first you must clear the way by blowing up unmanned drones. And once you get into the new section, the streets are teeming with more unmanned drones, Then you can continue with the main story, only to find more unmanned drones. You then make your way further into the story in anticipation of a boss fight, only to realize that it's another unmanned Alfred. drone. I saw Sam. Initial scans indicate that the craft is unmanned and being controlled remotely. Weapons lock deactivated. You want to take a break from all of this and focus on the side missions instead? Well... Batman took out a drone. And then you realize you're only 25% into the game. Now this would have been fine if the game were named Vigilante 8, Twisted Metal, or, or something of that nature, but this is Batman. The Batmobile is always a welcome addition, but when the game is designed specifically around accommodating the vehicle instead of the main character, then we have a huge problem. And unfortunately, in this game, it's a problem that keeps on persisting. But let's not dwell too much on the Batmobile, because despite it being one of the game's shortcomings, there are many other positive aspects of the gameplay that deserve some recognition namely the combat. This is the rock-solid free-flowing gameplay mechanic that has been a staple throughout the Arkham series. And right from the first game, the combat looked great, it looked fluid, and it revolved around the player's ability to react to specific visual cues to build up their combo counter. This time around, there's more emphasis not only on your reaction, but in your timing and execution. The developers managed to attain this by watering down the counter ability. The counter was overpowered in past games, and no matter where you were or what you were doing, if your opponent cues you to counter and you do it, you automatically dropped everything and flew halfway across the screen to counter that move. And this time around, if you're in the middle of an attack animation and you get the visual cue to counter, chances are you won't be able to do it unless your timing is precise. And the timing and executions get tougher with larger enemies who have a tighter startup frame advantage. Don't get me wrong, it's still not the most challenging or deepest combat mechanic you can find, but it's one step closer to getting there. Another improvement that really stands out is the introduction of new enemy types, uh, more notably the medics. These guys run around the battlefield reviving opponents you've knocked out and they also buff some of them with a suit of electrical armor which forces you to avoid them or utilize some of your gadgets to deal with them without having to touch them. There are also some hulking brutes that can switch their weapons or fighting styles in the middle of combat. On occasion they switch to a shield for a more defensive approach, then switch to electrical gauntlets that will force you to keep away, or at times they pull out retractable blades when they're feeling a bit more aggressive. 
All this changes our breath of fresh air in what was starting to feel like a stale combat system. I only wish that the same amount of uh, attention was applied to the predator sections to make them more challenging. The only notable addition is having the ability to seamlessly transition from vantage points to grates or vice versa using vents. Alfred. Aside from all this, the game does have a variety of different side missions you can tackle in order to clean up the streets of Arkham. Most of the side missions usually revolve around doing some sort of light detective work that usually focuses on locating, then hacking, scanning, or sabotaging items. They're all fairly repetitive, but the game does a great job of keeping you at it in anticipation of finding out the sinister minds behind these crimes. The only issue to all of this is that once you've managed to complete the side missions, they're often met with non-existent or underwhelming boss fights. Now with that said, I can't exactly speak for all side missions because there was one I didn't manage to complete, but it wasn't for the lack of trying. Much like the previous games, the Riddler challenges are scattered throughout the city, but this time around, solving them is supposed to culminate with a fight against the Riddler and it will also unlock the true ending. Now, I was not able to complete this due to a technical issue that plagued a specific area of the game. There were two trophies I needed to find within a given area, but the game wouldn't allow me to try and solve the puzzles until I cleared the room of enemies. The only problem is that the room was already cleared of any opponents. I tried everything I could to find a solution, uh, leaving and re-entering the area, closing and restarting the game, coming back to it after finishing the main story. No matter what I tried, it was all in vain. I just couldn't get it to work. I later realized that I wasn't the only one experiencing this issue, and the only solution was to try it again in New Game Plus. Now this is a huge issue, especially since completing the Riddler trophies is such a huge part of this game's conclusion. And for that I definitely have to take some points away. There are other technical issues I consistently ran into. The game would crash and stick at specific points with the only solution being unplugging and replugging my PS4. A simple restart wouldn't even fix this issue. And running into these types of problems in a fully completed game made by AAA developers is unacceptable. Now for all its gameplay elements, when it comes to the story, the game's plot is very simple and straightforward. The Scarecrow is threatening to unleash the fear toxin on Arkham and has partnered up with a masked individual who has a bone to pick with Batman. And your job is to stop them. And that would have been fine if we had some character development of the Scarecrow throughout the game, but no. You see, the Scarecrow makes an appearance once or twice and vanishes for the vast majority of the game. The only exposition we have of the Scarecrow is the random words of discouragement he mutters every once in a while from a billboard terminal or from his henchmen repeating the same lines over and over again as you glad past their general area. This was a rare chance to explore a villain who's a fearmonger, a crooked mind that preys heavily on the deepest most twisted fears of society. I mean, how great it would have been to explore this individual's past, or to explore how he became what he is, or to learn more about his rationale and the build-up of his unrelenting hatred for the Batman. There were so many possibilities that could have been examined to help this game reach greater heights, but all of that went out the door in order to rely on the more familiar Joker, who has been a strong part of the game from the very beginning. Now, this is not to say that I didn't like the Joker. In fact, he was my favorite part of the entire game. This time around he comes back as a figment of Batman's imagination, haunting him at every turn and slowly picking away at his sanity and joyful anticipation of his downfall. And the implementation of the Joker in the game was simply amazing. He appears at exactly the right time regardless if you're just scouting the city or calculating how to take down opponents from a vantage point. His constant presence makes him feel like Batman's closest ally and especially having been the catalyst that led to most of Batman's grievances. In a very strange way, he becomes the only person who truly understands Batman's torment. They are, after all, two sides of the same coin, and the game does a spectacular job of portraying that. But all of this has been tried and tested to the point of exhaustion, and that's why I'm very disappointed that the potential of what they could have done with the Scarecrow was tossed to the side. I've got it, Bats, I've got it! The Arkham Knight is you! Elementary, my dear Batson. Can there really be anyone else who thinks that's a good look? Fortunately for us, Arkham Knight continues with strong audio production values that we've come to expect and love from the series. 
especially with soundtracks. And it should. This is the Batman after all, and it continues the trend of moody tracks that typically start with a somber tone, building up aggressively at the right moments, eventually culminating with bursts of anger or sadness, not only to complement the dreary and gothic Arkham, but to amplify the intensity of the events occurring on screen. And epic soundtracks aside, what's most impressive is the sound effects of fictitious items that are captured so well, especially when it comes to the Batmobile. The gadgets hold their own as well, be it the sound of the ice grenade as it explodes and envelops an opponent in ice, or the sound of the springs and pulley system in the grappler working to launch Batman into the air. Everything was done right and the sound effects make these gadgets believable. The only issue I had with the audio stems from the technical issues yet again. Throughout the earlier sections of the game I did run into sync issues. Once again, not something that you'd expect from such an experienced development team. Good to have you here, Batman. Bring her down to the lockup on the lower level. Fortunately though, the problem does rectify itself, and about one third of the way into the game I never had these issues again. Now visually, Arkham Knight is running on the Unreal Engine 3. This is an engine that has been around since 2004 and it has seen many improvements over the years, but at this point the game looks pretty standard for what you'd expect from this engine. While it doesn't really impress graphically, it compensates for that from a more technical standpoint. Arkham City is now larger than ever before and has been split into three islands, Miyagani Island, Bleak Island and Founders Island. Each city plays to its strengths and settings. There is a commercial area where commerce seems like the primary function. One is more industrial with ports and cranes scattered all over the island. The other is a developed city center engulfed by skyscrapers and a maze of buildings directly underneath them. The game is definitely large, but to add to that it's filled with several destructible objects scattered throughout the city. The Batmobile can easily tank through pillars, vehicles, railings, and even take out chunks of buildings. Gliding above the skyscrapers and turning on your detective vision will surprise you with how many convicts they manage to squeeze into a given area. Now aside from technical achievements, the camera work also deserves some praise here. There are seamless transitions in between gameplay sections and in-game cutscenes. <laughs> and let's not forget those jump scares. I have to admit, they got me successfully with each attempt. Batman. So there you have it. Batman Arkham Knight, a game with so much promise held back by poor gameplay design and technical issues. But underneath it all lies improved core concepts that we all loved about the previous games. It's a struggle between the two concepts as they tear away at each other, but at this point the game is walking a fine line of mediocrity. And whether or not you should get it really depends on how invested you are in the Batman universe. And so as usual, thanks for watching. Take me on home to the asylum, never alone in the asylum. <laughs> Anarchy rule, it was wild, but through it all you never smiled. Joke's on you, I'm in your head, so look who's laughing now. Remember in Arkham City. I killed your girl. So pretty. That was the night you let me die. But when I looked you in the eye, that's when I knew we'd 
be together. Look who's laughing now. I'm stuck in your head and I'm laughing. Ha! I feel you with dread and I can't stop laughing. Your parents are dead and I can't stop laughing.